Good afternoon, and welcome to the U.S. Institute of Peace on what I hope will be the last snowy day in the winter season in Washington. Thanks to all of you who made it here today. Uh, my name is Mike Yaffe. I am the Vice President of the Institute's Center on Middle East and Africa. And I have the honor to be joined today by the Tunisian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Kamayas Jinawi, as well as Tunisian Ambassador Faisal Goya, and friends and colleagues from throughout the United States and partner organizations in DC and throughout the globe. I would like to thank particularly our friends from the Tunisian Embassy for partnership, uh, partnering with us today in organizing this important event. U.S. Institute of Peace was founded in 1984 as an independent national institute dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible, peace is practical, and peace is essential for the United States and for global security. We pursue this vision of a world without violent conflict by working with uh, partners on the ground in local areas, and we provide people, organizations, and governments with the tools, knowledge, and training to manage conflicts so it does, they don't become violent, and when they do, to help resolve them. Today's discussion will highlight the crucial role Tunisia plays in developing inclusive democracies, countering violent extremism, and building peace in a region facing instability, uncertainty, and violence. We will explore how the U.S. can continue to develop a strong partnership with Tunisia in supporting U.S. national security and foreign policy interests. In pursuing our vision of the world without violent conflict, USIP has worked closely with Tunisia to support governance reform, strengthen civil society, and promote peaceful and constructive dialogues to address internal conflicts. USIP's work in Tunisia is bolstered by the presence of our field staff based in Tunisia, based in Tunis, excuse me. One such example of USIP's strong engagement in Tunisia and in, in Tunisian civil society is what we call our Alliance on t of Tunisian Facilitators. These are individuals who employ mediation techniques taught by the USIP to facilitate dialogues at the local and, and community level. Recently, the Alliance members engaged leadership from both student unions at the University of Manuba to address political tensions and prevent <laughs> violence on the campus. This resulted in an agreed code regulating student conduct, which was launched last October in the presence of the university administration, its faculty, and the education minister. This historic document represents a significant achievement for peace in Tunisia, and our team is hoping to replicate it in our efforts in other schools and at other unions. Among the supporters within the Tunisian government for our alliance is Foreign Minister Janawi. It is my pleasure to have Minister Janawi with us today to continue the conversation on Tunisia's role as a democracy in the region. Minister Janawi was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs in January 2016. Before his appointment, he was the Diplomatic and Foreign Affairs Advisor to the President and has also held the position of Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. He has served as Tunisia's Ambassador to the Russian Federation, Ukraine, United Kingdom, and Republic of Ireland. His dedication to peace brings him here today to share his perspectives and answer, que and answer our questions. After delivering his remarks, Minister Janawi will be joined by Ambassador William Taylor, Taylor our Executive Vice President at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and Amb Ambassador Taylor will moderate the discussion. So please welcome Minister Janawi. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Honorable uh, Vice President of USIP, Ambassador William Taylor, Dr. Michael Yaffe, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
It is indeed a great honor to have the opportunity today to address the, this gathering in the prestigious United States Institute for Peace, to whom I am really grateful for the opportunity. I also avail myself of the opportunity to acknowledge President Nancy Lindenberg and Ambassador Taylor, two to France of Tunisia, and praise their relentless commitment with the rest of the USIP team to enhance bilateral relations between Tunisia and the United States of America. I would like also to like uh, to point out that the establishment in Tunis of USIP hub represents a milestone on the path of promoting peace in our region, a cause to which Tunisia remains firmly committed. I will not miss the opportunity today to recall one of the historical moments in the interaction between Tunisia and this institute when back in May 2015, His Excellency President Beji Khaid Sebsi on an official visit to the United States was here as a special guest and gave a lecture on the theme Beyond Security, Why U.S.-Tunisian Strategic Partnership Matters, during which Ambassador Taylor was then also the moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, today Tunisia is again honored at this prestigious institute with this special event offering the opportunity to reflect on why Tunisia should matter for the new administration uh, in Washington. The answer to this question can be found not only in the long history of relationship between the two countries, but in the present as well. As I mentioned yesterday to the Secretary of State, Mr. Rex Tillerson, Tunisia is proud of its deep-rooted and long-standing ties with the United States of America that date back to 1797. And with this year, we are celebrating the 220th anniversary of the first diplomatic link between Tunisia and the United States. These relations were consolidated during Tunisia's struggle for independence, stretching to the building of the modern Tunisian state to January 14, 2011 revolution, we are today sincerely grateful to the United States of America for all the support provided throughout our common history. It is, the fact, it is a fact that the United States support, through several mechanisms, programs, as well as financial and military assistance, was a significant contribution to in Tunisia efforts to build a modern and democratic state. Ladies and gentlemen, Tunisia transition today towards democracy has been fraught with challenges and crises, but unlike other countries, however, Tunisia opted for dialogue as a way to resolve conflict and build consensus. That is no coincidence. Tunisia enjoys a singular modernist and reformist tradition and a strong supportive civil society. Having achieved major strides in the political process with the adoption of a new constitution that enshrines secular universal values and democratic standards, Tunisia is once again offering a model and an alternative to radicalism and to all forms of extremism. Nevertheless, the Tunisian experience is still fragile and vulnerable to domestic and regional threat. Budgetary pressures, social pressure due to the persistence of unemployment and rising prices, terrorism and extremism are real threat that could hamper the transition process. Moreover, regional conflicts, mainly the situation in Libya, neighboring Libya, have further complicated Tunisia endeavor and yearning towards a stable, secure, modern, and democratic country. Terrorism emerged as a scourge from which no country is immune. Rec recent worldwide tragic events have illustrated the expansion of the world map, map of terrorism, showcasing its global aspect, which needs a global response, not only by military means, but also by uh, 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 an ideological and social approach. The war against terrorism declared by Tunisia after the terrorist attack in 2015 takes a particular significance after the unprecedented attack on Bengarden, the uh, small, cant a small city in the south of Tunisia, by Islamic State militants who attempted to proclaim a Daesh province 
in the south of the country. The first anniversary of the, the heroic battle of Bingarden was celebrated a week ago as it came to be known as a sign of Tunisia resilience and invulnerability to Daesh expansion ambition in the region thanks to the heroic, he, heroic and patriotic reaction of the local community and of course our brave military and security forces. It is indeed very significant that the security partnership and cooperation against terrorism and extremism were at the center of the recent telephone conversation between President Beji Sebsi and President Donald Trump on the 17th of February. The two leaders agreed to maintain close cooperation in order to win the war on terror against which nobody is immune. Tunisia is indeed at the forefront of the anti-terror war and has made counter-terrorism a high priority on the national level and in, a, in its international relation. Around 20% of the public budget will be devoted to security in 2017. This is a considerable national effort as Tunisia faces a wide range of other pressing challenges, mainly in the economic and social fields. Tunisia adopted in August 2015 a law on combating terrorism and money laundering, which is in line with international standards and best practices and reflects Tunisia's engagement to honor its international commitments. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, in order to tackle the terrorism threat, Tunisia also adopted in November 16, a national, uh, 2016, a national strategy to combat extremism and terrorism strategy that endorses a multidimensional approach articulated around four pillars, prevention, protection, po prosecution, and response. As part of our commitment to contribute to the international efforts against terrorism, we have joined the Global Coalition Against ISIS in September 2015. This coalition proved to be very effective and Tunisia will be actively participating to the ministerial meeting on the defeat of ISIS due to be held in Washington on March 22nd. On this occasion, Tunisia will reiterate its commitment to this collective response to the common threat of terror. We will also underline the importance of a holistic approach in the war against terror taking into consideration the need for multidimensional solution, including the support for economic growth and employment in order to completely eradicate terrorism from our society. In this regard, I would like to express Tunisia gratitude for the valuable assistance that the United States is providing in the framework of our increasingly effective cooperation to prevent extremism, radicalism, and terrorism. The selection of Tunisia on the 16th as the 16th major non-NATO ally of the United States of America sends a strong signal of support for Tunisia's choice to join the world of the world democracies. Thanks to the support of our partners, among which the United States of America, the security situation in Tunisia has significantly improved over the, the last couple of years. Ladies and gentlemen, we equally commend the American financial assistance that contributed in helping our young democracy overcome economic and security hardship. We, remo we remain hopeful that this assistance will be further strengthened as Tunisia is going through an exceptional and critical phase in its history and, and thus needs exceptional support from its actual friends and partners, such as the United States of America. In order to help the country tackle the growing security and economic challenges and meet the people needs and expectations. A stable, secure, and democratic Tunisia will be a real blow to non-democratic forces which hate fundamental freedoms and capitalize on the disillusionment and discontent of some segment of the Tunisian society by introducing regressive and obscurantist ideologies in order to cause instability and jeopardize modernist social achievement made since the independence. Ladies and gentlemen, 
restarting the national economy, which is deeply linked to the improvement of the security situation, reducing unemployment among university graduates and regional disparities needs major infrastructure projects, especially in the internal region that will help laying the foundation for an inclusive and long-term growth. In this regard, I just had before this, me this uh, meeting, uh, 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 a meeting with the, MCs, uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation Leadership Board of Directors, which to which we, I, we express our gratitude and thanks for selecting Tunisia and making it eligible for funding under the compact program to tackle such a problem and eradicate poverty through economic growth. In dealing with this challenge, Tunisia has been engaged in process of reforms with the aim to improve the economic environment, securing an investment-friendly climate with an equitable share of development and revenues. Hence, the Tunisian government has already enacted major and challenging reforms. The investment law, the public-private partnership, the banking sector reform, and most importantly, a legal framework pertaining to transparency and anti-corruption, which is one of the most comprehensive in the region. It is undeniable that the Tunisian market remains an interesting asset for economic development for both local and foreign investment. Nonetheless, the, the main case, case, uh, case to success will rely on restoring socio-economic socio stability and addressing security concerns. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a fact that Tunisia's stability and prosperity are tightly related to, to its geopolitical situation, uh, particularly in North Africa. In that regard, it is obvious that the political stalemate in Libya, alongside the dangerous deterioration of the security situation uh, of the security situation in that country, affects Tunisia as well as all neighboring countries, generating tremendous threat to the future of the region as a whole. Taking into, into account the situation in Libya and the region and the important and vital stakes for Tunisia, we have taken the endeavor to help facilitate a consensual, peaceful settlement of the crisis in Libya. President Bejikait Sibsi launched in mid-December 2016 an initiative associating two other neighboring countries, namely Algeria and Egypt, and with the aim of working to facilitate, uh, uh, facilitate and commit all together to work uh, uh, a direct contact between the Libyan faction in order to reach a consensual and comprehensive political settlement in the framework of the UN-sponsored agreement on December 2015. Subsequently, a ministerial meeting between Tunisia, Algeria, and Egypt was held on February 19th and 20th 2017 in Tunis as the first major step on the path towards a common position of the three neighboring countries and their commitment towards a comprehensive sol solution. The meeting allowed the three ministers, the three foreign ministers, to share the results of their consultation with the Libyan involved parties and to prepare for holding a tripartite summit dialogue in Algeria. Thus, the initiative became a, trilat a trilateral one. The Tunis, the Tunis Declaration for a Comprehensive Political Settlement in Libya, adopted by the ministerial meeting, emphasized the import, important aspect, such as uh, respect of Libyan sovereignty, the rejection, the rejection of any foreign inter interference or military escalation, and to consider that the settlement will be only political between the Libyan themselves, regardless of their political orientation and affiliation. The declaration also stresses the role and the responsibility of the United Nations to support and follow up any inter-Libyan dialogue with the involvement of the three neighboring countries. This initiative created three positive dynamics. One, a first dynamic consists in the great convergence between the three countries in attitudes and political concept and vision for a peaceful political solution after the signature of the declaration by the ministers of the three countries and its adoption as a platform for dialogue between the Libyans 
and as an official document to the United Nations, the African Union, and the Arab League. Two, a second dynamic was created among the Libyan parties, as they, shown, they have shown the desire to end the stalemate and reach a political and peaceful exit from the crisis, and as the representative of institutional forces inside Libya expressed their confidence in Tunisia, and particularly in the vision and position expressed by its president. Third, think, uh, thir the initiative has created a dynamic among influential countries on the international and regional arena by supporting this tripartite approach and the effort which aim to create a climate of mutual trust between the Libyans in order to return to the negotiating table and reach compromise solution to, co to difficult issues and considering that a ministerial statement reflect the will of the international community. This trilateral initiative needs to be further supported by international partners, particularly the United States as a privileged partner in resolving the Libyan crisis. However, it is important to say that the, this initiative ha, and the huge efforts deployed to make it succeed do not aim to impose any solution to the, on the Libyan, but to rationalize their position in order to reach a consensual and inclusive agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, the initiative for Libya is but another proof, if needed to be, of Tunisia's commitment and determination to play a role not only in its immediate geopolitical environment, but on a global scale as well. Our proactive role in the Arab world, illustrated by the successful completion of our recent mandate at the head of the Arab League Council, and our full-fledged involvement and contribution to the advancement of the African affairs are significant and do reflect the importance of, of the place Tunisia holds and the respect it enjoys among its fair. Taking into consideration all these aspects, I can safely state that Tunisia stands as a reliable strategic partner of the United States of America. As such, stable Tunisia can only be an asset both regionally and globally, and that would not only serve Tunisia interests, but also those of the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, Allow me to conclude with a few thoughts as a response to the theme of the event, why should Tunisia matter for the new U.S. administration? In a nutshell, nutshell I can state that Tunisia and the United States enjoy long-standing ties of friendship and cooperation. These ties need today and more than ever to be further strengthened and diversified for the mutual interest of our two friendly countries and peoples. Tunisia, an open, tolerant, and proud country of its Arab, African, and Mediterranean heritage, is a strategic ally to the United States and a trusted partner and friend in the region. Tunisia, with the collaboration of European Union and American partners, could be a model of a country which is capable of social resilience in the fight against the scourge of terrorism and extremism in the region. Tunisia which has all the ingredients of stability, a harmonious society, a young and vibrant democracy, and constant policy of non-interference could play a major role in reinforcing the pillars of security and stability in the region, especially in brotherly Libya. Tunisia, at the end, and the United States of America share the same values and should be strong partners in combating terrorism and mainly ISIS. Thank you very much for your attention. So far, Minister. Have Thank you. Yes, sir. And you can sit in front of your flag. <laughs> there we go. I hate reading. <laughs> so, so your reading is done. Uh, yes. <laughs> So, uh, Minister, let me, th first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for being here. Um, uh, let me also thank everyone who has jammed into this room. Uh, this is a tribute, Minister, to what, what you are here to talk about, and that is the importance of Tunisia, um, by the people in this room. 
coming out on a difficult day. Um, so I we really appreciate that. And there are people behind these cameras back here, um, many of whom had intended to be here, but they're going to be here watching you um, on online. So there are others um, that are that are back there. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to have a conversation with you. And as you saw uh, next door, uh, we've been able to bring representatives from the Defense Department um, uh, and from the, the United States Agency for International Development uh, and the State Department uh, here, the three Ds that we say. Uh, and representatives from the Congress are also here, whom you will see again uh, tomorrow. Uh, so and, Ambassador there, Wallace. and we have a former ambassador, <laughs> Ambassador Jake Wallace here, who uh, we're very pleased to see back here. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for us to have a conversation with you, and I will shortly ask the, you all in the audience for your questions uh, uh, for, the, for the foreign minister. Because you are tired of reading, uh, but you gave a great statement, Minister, about the answer to the question, that is, why Tunisia should matter to the United States. We here in this country um, have had an unusual election. Um, some of the conversations during this election campaign, this past election campaign last fall, uh, centered around the role of the United States in the world. Um, and some argue that we should look first to the United States, look first to home. Others argued that, no, nope, we have some responsibilities abroad. You have just made the case for Tunisia. Um, uh, I remember the last time you and I were together, um, actually. I visited uh, the, the foreign minister uh, in Tunis on election day. Um, and I went to bed uh, Tunisian time before the polls closed here in, uh, in the United States. We shared our predictions. Yep. <laughs> about, so it, it was a very interesting conversation. Don't tell them. Uh, right. uh, we, we had very, but that was an interesting election. Yes. Um, and it did have this, this, these questions um, uh, raised about the role of the United States in the world. Yes. Um, you've, given, you've, you've talked about shared values, and you talked about uh, the role of Tunisia uh, in fighting terrorism and, and extremism. Um, um, I know you've had a conversation with Secretary of State, and you'll have an opportunity to talk to the Congress tomorrow. In, in your words, then, what would you say to people in the heartland of the United States about why Tunisia is important? Well, Tunisia is important because, as I said in my speech, that it's, uh, this is a country which has a very long history of friendship with the United States of America. So it does not uh, depend on uh, one single administration. It, uh, it goes back to 120 years. Uh, uh, and uh, we think that uh, we are good friends because the uh, United States was there when Tunisia was struggling to gain independence, and the United States helped Tunisia within the United Nations, uh, making its case, you know, to obtain its independence. Then, when we start building a new uh, uh, state, a modern state, United States was among the first countries to come to Tunisia and help Peace Corps and other, uh, many other programs, USAID and many other agencies were there in Tunisia, helping Tunisia in the remote area of Tunisia, you know, uh, getting uplifted and, uh, uh, you know, getting access to, ma to major uh, important services. So we are grateful to that kind of relationship. Now, since 2011, we have started a new, new, new page of our history, and the United States was there uh, uh, among the first countries to say this is uh, something unique which deserves the attention and the support of uh, this country and uh, uh, land the required support to Tunisia. So we don't think that there is uh, uh, what is happening here in the United States, and this is something domestic which uh, we don't have any business on t of talking about it. Uh, I think uh, this is something uh, for the American to judge, but we say that this long-standing friendship deserves the attention because what Tunisia is doing is for the interest of Tunisian, but also for the interest of the American people. <coughs> Minister, you also described um, another of the values uh, that, that Tunisia represents to the United States um, is your stabilizing role in the region. 
Um, you mentioned that uh, Tunisia is a strategic ally, a major non-NATO na major non-NATO ally of the United States. Um, but you are also taking initiatives which you described. Um, the tripartite initiative on Libya. Yes. Maybe you can say a little more about that, in that one of the things that the Institute of Peace does is we try to encourage, help, support local governments and local people resolve conflicts themselves. Um, this is not for us to do, this is for Tunisians to do and, and eventually Libyans to do. Um, but how is, that, uh, how is that process going to result in, uh, in, in more stable part of that world? Well, we are in the beginning of a process because the situation in Libya is intolerable. It's a, it's a difficult situation and uh, we think that uh, uh, just uh, we hear today that there are some fights going on in Tripoli. So this it's in the immediate neighborhood of Tunisia and Tunisia has uh, a stake in helping the Libyans, you know, getting together, finding a political settlement of their difference. We think that there are all conditions for the Libyans to uh, settle their difference. This is a harmonious society, uh, a society with no ethnic or major ethnic difference, and there is no reason that the Libyans should not get together and settle their difference and have a stable government, you know, uh, to be an interlocutor for the rest of the world. We need a stable Libya next to Tunisia because our experience is interlinked with the situation in Libya. Libya was a major a partner of Tunisia, $2.5 billion exchange were made to th in 2010, but unfortunately all this has evaporated because of the situation in Libya. But also Libya now is becoming, unfortunately, a safe haven for all these terrorist groups trying to settle down, you know, in a country where there is no strong central government. So it is our duty to help the Libyans, uh, the Libyans with whom we have uh, also a uh, very strong relationship uh, going back, uh, you know, centuries. Uh, but also it is in the interest of Tunisia and the neighboring countries to help that country, you know, settle their, uh, uh, settle its problems. Minister, you uh, mentioned that you had seen Secretary Tillerson <clears throat> um, yesterday. Um, he has been to Libya, I suspect, in his previous job. You said he hadn't been to Tunisia, not uh, the oil, uh, oil reserves in Tunisia are less than the in No, Libya. I didn't say that. Oh, you didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> Never said that. But he did visit <laughs> Libya. And, and, and you invited him, I know, to uh, come to uh, Yes, come to I invited him as a friend of Tunisia to come and visit and witness by himself the, uh, the work done in Tunisia and how Tunisia is a good friend of the uh, United States. And stability in Libya will be important for you, your economy, um, your stability, but it's also important for the world economy, for that, yes. for the oil reason. Yes, uh, well, uh, you, you, the stability in Tunisia will... The stability in Libya and will... Li yeah. yeah, the stability in Libya, of course, it's, uh, it's important for the security first of uh, the Libyans, of the neighboring country, but also of Europe. Uh, Libya is just uh, 50, uh, Tripoli is just 50 minutes from uh, uh, Italy, so it's, it's very important. Uh, the, it's a quite a strategic country where everybody has to look to help the Libyans settle their problems. Otherwise, if there is an explosion there, the, the, uh, the, its effect will uh, touch everybody, uh, including here in the United States. So there is a stake uh, of, for everybody to get interest in the, what is going on in Libya. Not just for oil. Not just for oil, no, that's right. But it does uh, affect the, the world economy. Yes. Um, and the price of oil. Um, yes. uh, when, uh, when the foreign minister was an ambassador, he was uh, the ambassador to Russia, the Soviet Union at the time. Um, no, it was in Russia. It was in Russia. And diplomat in the but Soviet Before that, it was the Soviet Union. Yes. Um, w again, one of the earlier times when we met, yes. uh, we had a conversation about uh, our different views of, uh, of uh, Russia. Um, but the oil price has some effect on the stability uh, in, in Russia. And so, again, if, if stability in, to, in Libya, supported by and facilitated by this tripartite work that you're doing, can, can put some downward pressure on oil prices, uh, that could be that could put some more pressure on Russia, as you have, uh, as you have pointed out before. 
Most probably, I think. Uh, but anyway, it was not the, uh, frankly speaking, it was not the strategic aim. Uh, our strategic aim when we started this initiative of helping the Libyans settling uh, their difference. Uh, but if, if uh, one of the results will be that uh, it's, uh, it will help stabilizing the oil price, then uh, it's good. I mean, for the Libyan, but the Russian, and uh, I'm sure for the Americans. A side benefit. Uh, I think that's exactly right. Um, Minister, let me ask uh, people in the audience if they would like to uh, ask questions of you. Um, and I will open this, uh, please, let's see, we, yes, uh, Garrett has, uh, wow, and thank you both for this, thing. okay. So we'll start right here. Emily, we can start right here. Emily has been working all day. I see we, we've, and despite the fact that the Institute of Peace uh, is in the middle of the snowstorm, uh, we had the uh, Kenyan, Prime Minister here, and former Prime Minister, and so Emily staffed that one as well, and as did Garrett. Thank you both very much. And yes, ma'am, your question. Uh, my name is Dohi Fasihin. I'm with Freedom House. It's a pleasure um, to be here and listen to you with your remarks. Um, I want to hear a little bit, if you wouldn't mind um, speaking a little bit about um, the democratization process um, in Tunisia. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your views on the, the Truth and Dignity Commission and how that's evolving in the country. I'd also love to, uh, we've been following the decentralization process in Tunisia and feel that that will be critical in bringing more support and representation to Tunisians in the interior. And I'd love to learn a little bit about your views on how that's going as well. Thank you. Should I Answer what, that one has several parts, so why don't you do that and okay. then the next then after that we'll take maybe two questions at a time. Yes, the uh, I think we have already achieved major steps in the democratization process. Uh, we have now stable institution with the uh, vibrant multi-party parliament. Uh, we have uh, pres a president directly elected by the people for the first time. Uh, we have uh, government enjoying uh, a large majority uh, within the parliament, 169 seats among 217. And we have uh, permanent institution uh, which were envisaged by the constitution. Uh, one, one of them, this is not, uh, I mean, the truth and the uh, uh, dignity uh, 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 commission is not part of the constitution. It's, it's, separate, it's not a constitutional uh, Commission, but uh, it's part of the process. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's working normal, and uh, almost on a weekly basis, there are some TV broadcasts showing uh, the situation of many Tunisians who were uh, victims of the old regime. And uh, uh, so I think it's, it's working properly. Uh, there is no uh, problem of having that uh, commission. Uh, it's part of the process. But besides that commission, we have many other commissions, like justice. For example, commission, we elected the Justice Commission, which should be running the justice uh, system in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. It's no more the, the Minister of Justice who, who runs the system. Mm -hmm. We have an independent uh, commission, uh, which uh, designates judges, uh, looks after their career, uh, move them from one place to another, give them notes, and the minister is watching. He is, not, he is no more involved in this process. So, uh, and it's, by the way, th this commission has a majority of women, 18 women among 32 members. So it shows that we, we went uh, quite, uh, uh, made uh, big strides in, uh, in that field also, giving a parity uh, between men and women. Uh, we, think, we think that we, we are very proud of the achievement made on the democratic process. But still, we are just in the beginning. We are not a democracy. We are not a democracy yet. We are, we are aspiring to become a real democracy. But democracy comes with security, with economic development, with prosperity, shared prosperity with all, among all Tunisians. But the, the will is there. We have a freedom of press. We have 46 TVs in Tunisia today. We have 146 parties. Uh, around 86 newspapers. We used to have one newspaper for almost 60 years. So we, we have 86 today. We have uh, around 100 uh, websites and electronic uh, media. So it shows it's, it's an explosion of free uh, freedom of expression. Uh, it is not an easy, easy to manage all this, 
but there is a strong will from the authorities to keep it w working and running well because it's, the, it's the, in the interest of the Tunisian people. The model that Tunisia provides um, of a democracy or near democracy, uh, I, I would say that it's a democracy. Minister. You say I, I would say that. I would say that. <laughs> we, we all have, there are flaws everywhere, including here. Yeah. Um, but um, in the region, um, uh, a Muslim Arabic democracy um, is unique, I believe, uh, in, and, uh, in Tunisia. So this is a, this is a model. I think the uniqueness of this experience is to show to the rest of the world that this picture between Islam uh, and democracy can work hand in hand. We want to demonstrate to the rest of the world that this is a Muslim Arab country, proud of its heritage, but ready, you know, to espouse international values and become member of the concert of democratic nations. I think we are on the right path. Uh, as I said, uh, we, we are just uh, a child of six years, a six years old child. So uh, we need some strength, you know, to grow <coughs> up. Uh, that's why we need the support of our friends to uh, get more immunity, you know, and to continue our uh, progress. Absolutely. Great question. Uh, Kim Holmes. Uh, Emily, right here. Kim Holmes, the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Minister, thank you, first of all, for uh, coming to the United States. It's important for you to be here uh, at this time. There's a lot of things in flux in Washington, and it's important to have your voice here at this time. Uh, as I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the foreign affairs budget of the United States is facing some fairly severe cuts, perhaps as much as 37 uh, percent for the, for the annual budget. And you've already had some discussions with members of Congress about this, I, I understand. Can you spend some time uh, describing how important the U.S. aid is to all of the goals that you have mentioned here? Uh, there's different kinds of aid, of course. There's economic support funds and there's security assistance. There's different kinds of aid. And it's important uh, as we here in Washington and the United States debate the impact of these budget cuts it's not just what happens with the State Department budget, but what also happens with the aid budget. So could you spend a bit of time uh, describing how important specifically the U.S. aid is to the objectives that you have described here today? Minister, why don't we take that one? That's an important question that uh, will give you uh, uh, opportunity to answer with that yeah. focus. Yes. Should I answer? Please. <coughs> I think by the purpose of my visit is not to talk about the cut of the aid is to the increase of the aid <laughs> so but this is something 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 you know uh, a debate uh, domestic debate going on here in the United States but I think it's vital what we uh, the kind of support receiving we receive from the United States is vital uh, because it helps us frankly speaking it was vital in improving the capabilities on the effectiveness of our fight against terrorism uh, it's uh, the capacity building, the training, the equipment which we have uh, ordered from the United States, but also we are getting as a uh, major non-NATO ally, uh, will help us, you know, fight a common enemy which is threatening not only Tunisia but also the United States. So we hope that despite this budgetary cut, that uh, whatever. Uh, uh, support we are getting from the United States it will not uh, be cut, but in the country it will be increased, and that's the kind of message which I wanted to, uh, well, I tried to convey to the congressmen, uh, uh, senators uh, whom I met uh, during uh, these last two days. Uh, on the economic front, also we uh, we hope that uh, the United States will continue giving the support it is doing now to Tunisia, not just as a financial aid, but also as uh, training, as uh, uh, helping Tunisians, you know, uh, reform its laws. And uh, Ambassador Wallace knows that uh, there are a few uh, ideas and few projects which we are conducting together. So we hope, uh, we hope that what has been achieved uh, in the last few years will continue and in the country will expand for the interest of both countries. That's our hope. 
Very good. Okay, so let's do two questions now, all the way in the back. Um, thanks, Emily. It's all on Emily's side here. Uh, it's coming, Garrett. Come, you're coming. You're coming. And also right here. Yes. Uh, right there in the gray jacket. Garrett. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Maria Mujahed. I'm 16 years old and I'm an exchange student in the U.S. with, with the U.S. Department. So at the end of your speech, you mentioned about the relationship between the U.S. and Tunisia. And for me, as an exchange student, I see about 35 exchange students from Tunisia coming to the U.S. every year. But at the same time, I don't see American exchange students going to Tunisia like at the same time. Meanwhile, I see exchange students going to, from America going to other North African and Middle Eastern countries. So for you, what do you think, like, other ways that can more strengthen the relationship between the, the two countries? Thank you. Very good. Okay, the exchange is very important, and I know that uh, Ambassador Wallace actually was responsible for getting uh, some of these exchanges going in this direction. This is important. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I thought it was going to be that guy, but, but stand by it. It's coming. It's, it'll, it'll, you watch. We'll do him now. Okay. There you go. Uh, oh, back one further. One further. There you go. That's who I meant. That's who I meant. Sorry I wasn't clear, Garrett. That was my fault. Uh, thank you very much. I thought you were taking questions from your friends. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> but now we are friends. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Sharawi. I'm um, from Egypt. I'm with American University. Uh, my question is, um, you know, um, Tunisian and Egyptians have longed for democracy for many years, but actually what has sparked the Arab Spring uh, wasn't just democracy, but um, the economic um, demands of the people. Uh, Abouazizi uh, burned himself because he didn't find uh, like a chance to, uh, to live properly or to live decently. So uh, after six years of the revolution that left the institution of, the, of Tunisia intact, and after the removal of um, the corrupt regime and, um, um, and Tunisia being blessed of uh, being away from um, like the, the main area of conflict in the Middle East, um, so why Tunisia is not doing so well economically? Um, and the people actually took out to the street, took to the streets because of economic reason primarily. Thank you. So Two questions then, one about exchanges um, yes. and one uh, the Egypt experience. Uh, no, but I didn't see the link between Egyptian and Tunisia, why Tunisia is not doing well in the economy. Uh, I didn't see the, the link. Uh, actually, I didn't link Egypt to, uh, to uh, Tunisia, just uh, um, pointed out to me uh, as Egyptian and we like, aspired for democracy. Um, mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, regarding the exchange, of course, this is one of the major uh, topics we are discussing with the, uh, our American friends. Uh, we would like to have more Tunisian coming first to the United States. We have the Thomas Jefferson program for Tunisian st students coming here, uh, but uh, we think that the number is not sufficient. We, we think that there is a possibility of increasing the, those numbers because investing in young people going, get, getting to American universities is investing in the future and in the relationship and the friendship between the two countries. But uh, regarding the, uh, some uh, stud American students going to, to Tunisia, there are a few of them uh, studying in Tunisia. We, we want more of them, frankly speaking, we open our universities to uh, more Americans. Uh, we used to have a very good institute uh, in Tunisia teaching uh, American diplomats Arabic. Uh, it was closed down after 2011. We are hopeful that it will come back because uh, it, was, uh, it was there for almost 40 years. So uh, it was uh, very efficient and it has its impact on, um, on many uh, uh, Ara uh, American diplomats who served in the Arab world. So there is a scope here to, for uh, further development in uh, uh, this, uh, this field. Regarding the economy in Tunisia and why it's not doing well despite 
the aspiration of the young people uh, in 2011. Unfortunately, you know, we, and before the revolution, we used to have a system. That system was running the country. It was doing, grosso modo, well in the economy. But because we used to have 5% rate of growth. That system has been, uh, has completely, I mean, has been changed, completely changed. And we are building a new system now. Another system, liberal system, linked to a political democratic system. It takes time to run that system because, for example, decision making now is not one person who takes the decision. We have to go through a process. Whatever, whatever agreement we have with the foreign country, we have to go through the parliament. It takes time to uh, approve those agreements and uh, uh, with the foreign uh, partners, and uh, uh, we lose a lot of time, dispo uh, you know, getting the money, dispersing, dispersing them, and uh, starting the projects. Uh, we are very aware of that. Uh, and that's why we, uh, of course, the, uh, the major reforms have already been achieved. Uh, we have uh, a new investment code now, We're trying to attract uh, more investment. We have a new law rela related to public-private partnership, a new banking law, uh, new competition law. Uh, the, all these legal framework will help, we hope, will make Tunisia more friendly for foreign uh, investors. But when you have, unfortunately, terrorist attacks, uh, this frightens, you know, uh, foreign tourists and uh, uh, the whole uh, sec tourist sector, uh, which represents 7% of our GDP, collapsed, almost collapsed in 2015. Uh, now, fortunately, thanks to the work done by our uh, security forces, uh, now uh, the situation is getting better and we are getting more tourists. So it's, it's, uh, it's a transitional process which does not respond as uh, quickly as the young people uh, wish it. Uh, but we are there, we know, we know that we have to improve the pace of reforms and respond to the expectation of uh, Tunisian people. And just on the point about, about Egypt, um, um, the fact that Tunisia is a democratic model and is the only Muslim Arab, Arab democracy in the region does give it an advantage on, as, as stability comes, um, the investors will be looking for democracies to invest in. And so I think that will, um, that will prove the, the wisdom of the, of the Tunisian people moving it forward. Okay, I'm gonna go back here, this young woman here, and then I'm gonna come back up here, <laughs> because I, uh, Garrett, right here, yes. Uh, very good, well done. Hi, thank you very much, Minister. I'm Elise Goss-Alexander with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about some of the non-military approaches that the government is taking to countering violent extremism in the country. You mentioned addressing unemployment for university graduates, but I was wondering if you could expand a little bit. Thank you. So there's that one. And then we'll take one other question at the moment. Oh, you know, I, I promised uh, Peter Tobin here, right here. So, okay, so religious freedom and Yes. Thank you, sir. PJ Tobia from the PBS NewsHour. Actually, in about two weeks, we're going with a, uh, a crew to Tunisia to do a couple of stories, um, sort of about the cultural resurgence of the country uh, in the last few years. One thing we're not going to be able to really touch on is the um, U.S. the U.S. Tunisia military relationship. I know that last year a fusion center was established, um, and that there I've, I've read somewhere that there were calls for um, more drone overs oversight. U.S. drones uh, on the Libya border. What would you like to see um, from an enhanced uh, military relationship with the U.S.? And, and what do you think the U.S. military can do uh, for the security of, of Tunisia? Two good different questions here. Two, absolutely. You, you can choose which one you want to do first. <laughs> <laughs> well, the religious freedom, I think. Okay. I, I don't think there is any problem of, uh, uh, of religious freedom in Tunisia. It's uh, enriched in the Constitution. Uh, we have one of the most modern constitution giving li uh, liberty of conscience to Tunisians, which means anybody in Tunisia can practice its religion freely. 
without the interference of the state. I think there are few free, free countries in the world which has this legal, legal sorry, uh, protection for the, the uh, religious freedom. Addressing radicalism, I agree with you, it's not just a security issue. It has to be multidimensional, <laughs> and that's why we laid down a number of programs uh, related to education, to social, uh, to the role of women, the role of family, role, role of the civil society, uh, to help these young people, you know, getting the right uh, education and the right bringing up uh, in order to uh, immune them against uh, extremism and uh, radicalism. We are in the process, at the beginning of the process, we are in good cooperation with different countries, particularly European countries, and uh, there are a, a whole program run, run now by different, uh, different uh, ministries and different departments in order to address this, uh, this issue. Uh, regarding uh, security, uh, I think we have uh, quite substantial cooperation between uh, Tunisia and the United States. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, is, uh, it relates, of course, to, as I said, to capacity building, to trading, but also the uh, United States is helping Tunisia, uh, you know, uh, uh, having the right and the proper tools, electronic tools, to monitor our border with Libya, uh, where there is a kind of fence which we are building with the United States, but also with the uh, Germans, uh, in order to protect our border. We have a quite uh, big border with Libya, 500. 40 kilometers, which is unprotected now, and uh, we have to find more uh, sophisticated and modern ways to uh, protect ourselves from any infiltration from terrorists from a uh, neighboring country. Glad PBS News Hour is going to visit uh, uh, Tunis. This is uh, you are welcome. Uh, very good. Okay, so two more here. Um, let's go here. One. Um, and in the back there, Garrett, right there, there you go. And Emily, right here. Uh, Munji Dawadi from the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy. Welcome, uh, Minister uh, in, in D.C. Um, given the uh, problematic uh, policies that the, this administration is pursuing uh, and its attitude toward uh, Muslims and Islam, uh, you mentioned that Tunisia is a Muslim uh, country, proud of its heritage, and it's also a democracy. Uh, I'm just you know, con uh, interested to know if, uh, what is the attitude of this administration uh, when you try to make that point to them, uh, that there is no contradictions between Islam and democracy, and that uh, many different parties uh, might have a framework of uh, uh, Islam within its understanding of uh, when dealing with politics. Are they receptive to that, to that kind of uh, idea? Very good. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Mossadegh Cabrera. I'm a Libyan researcher at Columbia University. In March 2015, the Tunisian Ministry of Commerce estimated the number of Libyan refugees in Tunisia to around a million refugees, which is roughly 10% of the Tunisian population. Given the economical challenges that Tunisia faces, Right now, um, are there any international, local efforts to improve the conditions of the Libyan refugees in Tunisia? Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, you have your choice which to do, which order. Yeah, well, uh, regarding Islam, uh, what uh, the colleague uh, qualified of problematic policy for Islam, I think uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, frankly speaking, I didn't have. Uh, the opportunity to raise this question because I don't think it's an issue for Tunisia anyway. Tunisia has been a Muslim country for 14 centuries now, and I don't think it's it's a problem of claiming to become to be a Muslim country. Uh, you mean maybe the political Islam? That's another issue. And political Islam in Tunisia is part of the whole spectrum. It's part of the government, and it's well integrated within the system, and, uh, the, the, uh, the political, uh, the Islamic party in Tunisia is playing, I mean, respecting the rules of the game, and uh, I think it's part of the whole system. It uh, does not raise any problem within Tunisia or with our... Uh, Minister, maybe the, maybe the question was, in your conversations with this administration in, in Washington, 
um, uh, that, that have, you know, there, there are allegations that the immigration ban on, mm -hmm. or restrictions on, uh, on Muslim countries, certain Muslim countries, um, demonstrated uh, some kind of an attitude that I th you may have been asking about. Was that your question? Also, the, 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 the uh, rumors about the, uh, the ban on uh, certain the, the political Islam uh, and, and designating certain groups in the Middle East as terrorist organizations, I mean, that, that, that's part of, uh, we are, of the... Uh, but we are not in the uh, Middle East. We are the North Africa. <laughs> we are, we're in a different part of the world. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, regarding the ban of uh, foreign, I think this is a sovereign, uh, frankly speaking. Yeah, we, we, we don't uh, question or discuss uh, this decision, which is part of the, uh, the sovereign, sovereign decision of the President uh, Trump. Uh, he can make for to protect the security of his country whatever measures he would like to make. Uh, Tunisia is not included in those countries, and uh, I think there is a motivation. The motivation is security more than the religion. Uh, that's how we understand it. Uh, so uh, the, we think, uh, we don't think that uh, we have to judge or prejudge such kind of decision from a Tunisian point of view. And you have the question on the Libyan refugees, um, for, right? The question on the Libyan refugees. Ah, yeah. Libyan, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. The Li Libyan. Well, uh, first of all, we don't consider them as refugees. Did we uh, ever said that we have 450,000 uh, Libyan living in Tunisia as refugees? Uh, we never raised this with the international community or the international organization. We consider them as part of the Tunisian society. They are well integrated. They live with us. We never claimed uh, any compensation for them, though they, you know, benefit of, uh, like any Tunisian citizen, from all the social support and uh, subsidies uh, from the government. But uh, we never uh, asked uh, this kind of question because we think that we have a very so strong relationship with the Libyan people. and. Uh, in 2011, when we received 1 million, 1.3 million uh, refugees from Libya, we never claimed this. They came, they went out from Tunisia, they didn't make any problem. Uh, they were received within the Tunisian families. Uh, they sent their children to uh, study in Tunisian schools, uh, and they are not making problems. So, frankly speaking, we, 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 we don't consider them as the refugees. And that, again, points out how, how Tunisia is a model, and uh, yeah. more countries uh, uh, probably should do that, that kind of approach on, yes. on refugees. Um, Ambassador, uh, I know you have other places to be. I, uh, there are many other questions that they would love, to, I, uh, but I don't want to put you off schedule here, so you and Amal can tell me when you have to. Uh, time for two more questions? Five minutes. Five, five minutes, okay. So uh, we'll do uh, this lady in the back and this gentleman in the front. So Emily here. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Rosalie Rubio. I'm a PhD student at George Washington University. So thank you for your time. Um, I wanted to ask you if you felt that Tunisia's current counterterrorism and security policy has impacted uh, Tunisia's attempts to consolidate its democracy, and if so, how and how might those challenges be overcome? All right, very good. Uh, yes, sir. Ah, you heard of, I tried it again here. I'm sorry, Emily. <laughs> That's right. All right, do, do two. Do two quick ones. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be quick. Uh, Howard LaFranchi with the Christian Science Monitor. Something of a follow up on my uh, colleague's question here, my friend's question in the back on the economy. But we've heard at least since the uh, Arab Human Development Report of 2002 that um, youth unemployment um, uh, must be addressed and that the problem of uh, radicalization of youth, you know, won't be addressed until uh, youth unemployment is brought down among Arab youth. And I'm wondering what progress have you, you know, have you made in over these years? I know you've talked about, about this, but what specifically has been done? What kinds of things are being done to address this uh, very critical issue to the problem of uh, radicalism and uh, extremism. Very good. Last question. 
Uh, hi, uh, I'm Amir Sferci, Fulbright Scholar, um, Tunisian Fulbright Scholar at uh, the School of International Service, uh, American University, and I want to ask um, Mr. The, the Minister about the rescheduling or the report or the reducing of the Tunisian debt, as we know that the Tunisian debt is a major challenge facing us, and have we uh, had uh, such initiative from uh, this new uh, U.S. government to continue to support Tunisia? And we know that the IMF and the World Bank and all the uh, lenders that gave us money are putting a lot of pressure on us about all the reforms. Thank you. Okay, Minister. So we have uh, counterterrorism versus democracy, uh, youth unemployment, and Tunisian debt. Um, uh, all in three minutes here. Yes, the ambassador yeah, we can make another lecture on these <laughs> three issues. That's right. Well, counterterrorism no, uh, law. Uh, we are uh, we are a new democracy now, so we have a law which we we should respect. Uh, but these are the enemies. I mean, these foreign fighters coming back to Tunisia or. Uh, Tunisians uh, who are involved in terrorism, yeah. Uh, there is a special law which was enacted in 2015. Uh, uh, it's very specific. Uh, uh, it uh, it uh, fixes uh, the rules to be applied for any uh, person involved in terrorism. So these people will be treated uh, according to the law. Uh, their human rights will be respected. Uh, but, of course, the, uh, the country has to protect itself from these individuals. So we are, we are very, very clear about this. Uh, we will apply for them the law, prevailing law. Uh, <coughs> youth unemployment, that's, that's a major issue in Tunisia. It was the uh, origin, the start of the revolution in 2011, uh, because, uh, unfortunately, we, have, we used to have, at the time, around 600,000 uh, young people without, uh, without jobs, among them 250,000 with university degrees. Uh, we were talking about democracy. These people, they are still waiting for the dividend of democracy, to show them that democracy is worth supporting because it improves their way of living. Uh, uh, to be realistic, uh, till now, because of the uh, economic situation, the country is not yet able to deliver to the expectation of those young, young people. Some of them have been employed. There are different programs which were uh, put by the government, you know, like uh, startups, encouraging people, you know, uh, having their own business, uh, developing kind of training and vocational training, you know, to give them the right training to uh, make them more, you know, uh, accepted by the, uh, by the uh, business uh, people. But still, there are hundreds of thousands of them still looking for jobs. Uh, and it's going to be for a number of years like that. Uh, some of them have been recruited by the first, by the government came, uh, coming after 2011, the Troika government. And uh, they were recruited by, by the, in the civil service. But unfortunately now, uh, because of that passive recruitment within the government, we have problem with the IMF, because we have to reduce the number of the people working for the government. So uh, it's, it's a difficult situation. It's not easy. Uh, we are aware of it. We are looking to find the way to respond to the expectation of those young people. We are having uh, different kind of programs with uh, our partners particularly in Europe. We, are, we just discussed with Germany the creation of a new university to, for vocational training, uh, which will be built immediately in 2017 in order to help those uh, young people, you know, with university degrees getting the right training and the right education to be uh, employed by the, uh, by the private sector. Which then leads to the last question on Tunisian debt, uh, yeah, IMF. Tun yeah, Tun uh, there is one, uh, one uh, you know, uh, uh, important policy which Tunisia pursued in the last 60 years. We never defaulted paying our debt. Till today, we have difficulties. We have major difficulties, pressure from the budget. But till now, we respect our obligation paying on time our debt. We hope that we'll continue like that. Some of our friends and partners started converting some of our debt into projects. 
just France, Italy, Germany lately, and uh, Switzerland, Belgium, different amount and different programs. Uh, but still, the debt is getting larger. It's around 56% uh, now of our uh, GDP. It's, it, uh, it, uh, in 2011, it was 46. So it's, it increased a lot in the last few years. Uh, it's a major problem, uh, but we are trying to find ways to convincing our friends and partners to help us uh, either, uh, you know, finding, uh, converting some of that debt into development projects. And some of our friends are responding to that request. Minister, you have answered the question, why should the United States and the international community support Tunisia to make it a success? Um, I want to thank you for doing that. Please join me in thanking the minister for his time.